The Boat on the Moon Two, by Sir Arthur C. Clarke. Before the silence grew oppressive, if he left it too long, someone would get scared. Pat rose to his feet and faced his passengers. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. He began. I hope Miss Wilkins has been making you comfortable. We've stopped here because this is a good place to introduce you to the sea, to give you the feel of it, as it were. He pointed to the windows and the ghostly greyness that lay beyond. Just how far away? He asked quietly. Do you imagine our horizon is? Or to put it in another way, how big would a man appear to you if he were standing out there? Where the stars seemed to meet the ground. It was a question that no one could possibly answer from the evidence of sight alone. Logic said the moon's a small world; the horizon must be very close. But the senses gave a wholly different verdict. This land, they reported, is absolutely flat and stretches to infinity. It divides the universe in twain. For ever and ever, it rolls onward beneath the stars. The illusion remained even when one knew its cause. The eye has no way of judging distances when there is nothing for it to focus upon. Vision slipped and skidded helplessly on this featureless ocean of dust. There was not even, as there must always be on Earth, the softening haze of the atmosphere to give some hint of nearness or remoteness. The stars were unwinking needle points of light, clear down to that indeterminate horizon. Believe it or not, continued Pat, you can see just three kilometers, or almost two miles, for those of you who haven't been able to go metric yet. I know it looks a couple of light years out to the horizon, but you could walk there in twenty minutes if you could walk on this stuff at all. He moved back to his seat. And started the motors once more. Nothing much to see for the next sixty kilometers, he called over his shoulder. So we'll get a move on. Celine surged forward. For the first time, there was a real sensation of speed. The boat's wake became longer and more disturbed as the spinning fans bit fiercely into the dust. Now the dust itself was being tossed up on either side. In great ghostly plumes, from a distance, Celine would have looked like a snowplow driving its way across a winter landscape beneath a frosty moon. But those grey, slowly collapsing parabolas were not snow, and the lamp that lit their trajectory was the planet Earth. The passengers relaxed, enjoying the smooth, almost silent ride. Every one of them had travelled hundreds of times faster than this on the journey to the moon, but in space one was never conscious of speed, and this swift glide across the dust was far more exciting. When Pat swung Celine into a tight turn so that she orbited in a circle, the boat almost overtook the falling veils of powder her fans had hurled into the sky. It seemed altogether wrong that this impalpable dust should rise and fall in such clean-cut curves, utterly unaffected by air resistance. On Earth, it would have drifted for hours, perhaps for days. As soon as the boat had straightened out on a steady course, and there was nothing to look at except the empty plain, the passengers began to read the literature thoughtfully provided for them. Each had been given a folder of photographs, maps, souvenirs, and informative text. They had only to read this to discover all that they wanted to know about the Sea of Thirst, and perhaps a little more. Most of the moon they read was covered by a thin layer of dust, usually no more than a few millimeters deep. Some of this was debris from the stars. The remains of meteorites that had fallen upon the moon's unprotected face for at least five billion years. Some had flaked from the lunar rocks as they expanded and contracted in the fierce temperature extremes between day and night. Whatever its source, it was so finely divided that it would flow like a liquid even under this feeble gravity. 
Over the ages, it had drifted down from the mountains into the lowlands to form pools and lakes. The first explorers had expected this and had usually been prepared for it. But the Sea of Thirst was a surprise. No one had anticipated finding a dust bowl more than a hundred kilometers across. As the lunar seas went, it was very small. Indeed, the astronomers had never officially recognized its title, pointing out that it was only a small portion of the Sinus Rauris, the Bay of Dew. And how, they protested, could part of a bay be an entire sea? But the name, invented by a copywriter of the Lunar Tourist Commission, had stuck despite their objections. It was at least as appropriate as the names of the other so-called seas, Sea of Clouds, Sea of Rains, Sea of Tranquility, not to mention the Sea of Nectar. The brochure also contains some reassuring information designed to quell the fears of the most nervous traveller and to prove that the Tourist Commission had thought of everything. All possible precautions have been taken for your safety, it stated. Saline carries an oxygen reserve sufficient to last for more than a week, and all essential equipment is duplicated. An automatic radio beacon signals your position at regular intervals, and in the extremely improbable event of a complete power failure, a dusk ski from Port Roris would tow you home with little delay. Above all, there is no need to worry about rough weather. No matter how bad a sailor you may be, you can't get seasick on the moon. There are never any storms on the Sea of Thirst. It is always a flat calm. Those last comforting words had been written in all good faith, for who could have imagined that they would soon be proved untrue?